Sign of departure, 7 I grew up riding in the back of airplanes. My mom was a pilot. She married a pilot. They ran an airport in Arlington, Washington when I was little. I don't even know what running an airport means. I know I was there a lot. The first time I went flying, I was five or six years old. And even though it was a warm summer day, I had to wear a winter coat. Riding in the airplane was like riding in an old Volkswagen in the winter. It was loud and cold and a little drafty. My mom had a VW Beetle too. It was painted like an airplane, white with blue Cessna stripes. It was just as loud and cold as riding in the backs of airplanes. Riding in the backs of airplanes, we went to breakfast and lunch and fly-ins. We flew near and far. It was how we spent our clear days flying. Bored in the back seat without a headset, I was always left out of the conversation between the pilot and whomever was flying with her. It was never me, even as I got older. Flying took my mom away from me as she logged hours and took classes. She got her ratings and moved away to fly. But flying also brought her back to me in a weird way. injuries. The other two family members on board had minor injuries and were taken to a Grangeville hospital. The family is from Kent, Washington. The initial investigation shows the plane went down after possible engine failure. The FAA will continue to investigate the incident. I had been writing a letter in the plane. It reads, 1400 hours Pacific Standard Time, Helena, Montana, August 24th, 1997. I've settled into the back of the plane. Today, a low storm front came in threatening to ground us here another day. Luckily, the storm moved north enough to let us off the ground. Although we are having to fly around the bottom of the storm to the south. From the air, the storm looks pretty icky. I'm uncomfortable with the turbulence. I'll write more when it smooths out. For now, I'm gonna nap. 1840 hours, August 24th, hill number 296. Red River Hot Springs. I woke up to hear my mom say that we went too far. Todd tapped on an instrument and the engine sounded wrong. Mom turned the plane around. We were flying over rugged, heavily wooded mountains. As soon as I knew something was wrong, I freaked out. We hit, flipped over the nose, and rolled onto the right wing. When we stopped moving, I wondered if I was alive. I did a body system check, wiggled my toes and fingers, moved my head, checking if anything hurt. I opened my eyes and I looked down at my brother. His face was covered in bright, fresh blood, and I wondered if I was the only one of us alive. Then he opened his eyes. With that confirmation, I got myself out of the airplane. I kicked the door open and I climbed out. Todd was holding mom as she dangled from her seat belt, having convulsions. I pulled the engine compartment out of the way and broke off sheet metal so that I could get to them. After clearing a way into the front, I climbed back on top of the fuselage, tore the door off, climbed inside, and grabbed mom. Todd slid out from underneath her, and we got her out of her seat belt and onto the ground. I handed Todd his camera. He popped off a couple pictures, and then we worked to secure her bleeding. I got back into the plane to throw supplies clear of the leaking fuel in case this thing blows up. Todd and I got a tent up and moved mom inside. Every time we move her, she vomits blood. The smell of blood really stinks. Mom's head is pretty bad. Todd and I collected firewood, set up a fire pit. We're gonna build a big fire and try and get coals that will last all night. 21.15 hours, August 
Todd hooked up the emergency locator transmitter. He took it off the plane and put it up on a hill. He tried to get a strobe light to work, but it didn't. He also tried to get the radio going, but it was making sparks too close to the fuel. We crashed on a logging road. I cannot believe we lived. I cannot believe I have climbed out of a crashed airplane unscathed. I'm okay. Todd may have a broken collarbone. Mom, on the other hand, is in pretty bad shape. She has a huge gash above her eyebrow where her glasses jammed into her forehead. Her eyes come out. We have what's left of it strapped down with a bandage. Todd and I are very concerned for her life. I know she will die if we aren't rescued by morning. While it was still light out, a plane circled around a few times, but probably not close enough to see our fire or shiny emergency blankets. This is so weird, so wrong. It's a strange feeling knowing I'm gonna watch my mom die. The night sky is incredible. You don't fly that high, but um, you know, they generally just, they're really accurate maps. So we're flying over and we're spotting each and every grass strip and building and um, suddenly uh, mom uh, reaches up and starts fiddling with some knobs on the, on the, on the um, dash. And fairly, she starts working the carb heat lever because the engine started running kind of rough, or like instead of the nice smooth, you know, it started kind of gurgling a little bit. And so uh, a lot of times the carburetors will ice up as you fly really high. So there's this heater vent that kind of you flip it on and it warms up the uh, carburetor so to melt any ice that might be on the carb. And uh, yeah, um, that didn't work. <laughs> so... Then, right about then, the oil pressure gauge starts to do this number, and uh, she starts tapping on it, and um, and uh, kind of like keys up the mic, I, or losing oil pressure, or something like that. I look over and and I, edit, and I take my camera out, and I took a picture of it, <laughs> uh, which is kind of funny, cause you know the oil pressure gauge is supposed to be over like 120. And it was like over at 40. Uh, I have that picture blown up too. Uh, it's and the uh, RPMs are already starting to drop down. And um, there was another picture of the smoke just coming out from under the cowling. You can't even, I think that might be the picture. You can't even see anything out the front window. It looks just like a cloud bank, but it's smoke coming up from under the cowl. Um, yeah, then the engine went kaboom, <laughs> pretty much bam, and the cowlings popped up, the engine started shaking, and it just, uh, it felt as if the motor was going to break off at that point. I knew we were in trouble, <laughs> um, but it didn't break off. I was scared to death that the thing was just going to shake apart. Um, did you? Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it just felt like a very large... Like your engine just threw a rod. If you're driving along in your old Chevy and it goes like that, that's pretty much what happened. But it went kabam and um, shook violently. So and then the propeller stops moving, and we're gliding. Um, my mom, our mom, and uh, and I were having a discussion about um, where to land, and uh, I informed her that we just passed. Uh, a grass strip yeah, and she remembered the grass strip and um we thought for a second about turning around but um the grass strip is over that big ridge right there on the other side of it and uh we just came over that ridge so likely to turn around and be able to make it back over that ridge to the grass strip was not too good we were um gliding we were a glider at that point um so uh she says, find me a runway, find me a runway. I, there's none. Here, I have the map. There's no runways. It's just straight up and down. And, uh, and I look out the window, 
and I see this little teeny itty bitty road on the top of this mountain on this little flat saddle right here where they were sitting and uh, I go oh we gotta land there um and I'm taking a picture of it click <laughs> and uh I tossed the camera in the back and I told Q I said grab the sleeping bag hold on tight and um mom banked it around and brought it in and banked it around again and brought it in finally we come in and uh, uh, and that's when we started hitting trees and spinning <laughs> and kind of ended up upside down and backwards um, yeah it was a it was a um, very scary couple minutes gliding wouldn't you say I would say yeah I went to Kitty Hawk. Not only is it the location of the first flight, but also the location of so many crashes and the failures that led to their success. I saw the airplane was just a big kite bicycle, a kitesicle. I didn't fly very far and I didn't exactly have landing gear. I did learn that what made this airplane work at all was the flaps or ailerons. The twisting of the wingtips allowed the kitesicle to bank into a turn. The kitesicle First only soared a few feet. They kept trying, and with each tent, they got a little further down the way. I didn't learn anything that would help me understand the plane crash I was in, or much about flight or flying, but about ambition and motivation and curiosity. These men weren't afraid of falling out of the sky. sort of feels like maybe we were on the other side of that spot. But then I saw the video, so... Oh, there, and see there's video. So what are we listening to? A emergency locator transmitter. But this is the tool that uh, Jim used to find the ELT. Uh, it's just a direction finder and it's based upon a signal. And you can tell the difference if you see that's a clear signal. And then listen to it and it'll, it'll start deteriorating. See how it's deteriorating? So that's how you use it. It's kind of a simple tool, but it's really helpful. He's been talking about it on the way out, of how strong the signal got up here, and they were really afraid it was going to be down in the draw somewhere. I've been commenting almost continuously. What Todd did was perfect. It was. Yeah, put, the antenna, put the antenna up high. Yep. And they come around the corner, and here's an airplane parked in the road. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. <laughs> Make it easy on us. With survivors is yeah. even cooler. Fire going, coffee on, the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Well, with the antenna up there the way they had it even with my radio two miles down the road i had full signal no matter how i stood looking good i still it's i can't believe how far it is up here it's amazing it's a really long ways up i'm just glad we we're able to get up here at all do you think you could have found it mm, no i would have lost it back where that sign was i would have gone up the hill probably yeah and that road wasn't there when we were here
Can you, will you tell us where we are? Oh, great. Yeah. We are um, not in the Frank Church River of No Return. That's just over there on the other side of the valley. Um, we're, gosh, four hours drive out of Grangeville, Idaho, up a dirt road is where we are. Four hours from Grangeville, which is in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. It's four hours from the middle of nowhere in Idaho. So there's... <laughs> There is not a light or a flicker or even a reflection or, or any kind of beam of electricity coming from anywhere. We're so far away from anywhere. At, like I'm expecting a wolf to come out and, and munch us. Um, the deer has been circling us for the last hour. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, we are in the middle of nowhere. We're in the middle of nowhere in the uh, middle of Idaho. Um, south of Missoula, north of um, Sun Valley, um, west of Butte, east of Lewiston. So it's um, closer to Wyoming, excuse me, closer to Montana than than to uh, Washington. Um, yeah. How's it going? Oh, I've been better. Huh? I've been better. Yeah? Why don't you show us your hand? Wave your hand. Good. You're looking great, Mom. I think so. Yeah. That's well, considering... Camp, huh? Considering... Yeah. What, I see it. Oh, you're going to yeah, see it. Here. We're going to get you a nice view. Where, where life lights coming in off that. That's beautiful. Man, that's pretty. We somehow managed to survive. In here. This is what I call one thirty Cessna. I don't know if you can see this in the picture, but uh, that's where I was. Right about there. Kathy was in the back seat. And one of our rescuers here. We have a beautiful view. Sun's coming over the ridge. You pick the straightest road in 70 miles, they say. Here's our little camp where we spent the night. Back seat of the plane, fire, our rescue trucks. Here's the door. Coffee. Big trucks. Well, that's our rescue gear. Here comes Kathy. She's going good. Hi, Kathy. There's Elk Mountain. Um, yeah, we need uh, a ride from, uh, I guess we're going to go back to Grangeville, 
So uh, yeah, Aunt Karen should drive to Grangeville and meet us there, I guess, at the sheriff's office or wherever you guys plan on dropping us. And, um, <clears throat> so we can make arrangements to figure out what's going on. An easy too. They said they would like to walk down and meet them. Right okay. Hello, ma'am. My name's Bill. Paramedic, okay? okay? I just need to get you checked out so that we can get ready to go. I got all of her clothes in there. Great. Where are you hurt? Everybody else okay? Yeah, they're all right. These two. Right. Okay. And you guys are all okay? So well, far. Here's a, something What's hurting fresh you the most right now? Possibly. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you guys were okay? Yeah. Three, four minutes. Uh, she is aspirating. I I removed her tongue. She had swallowed her tongue, uh, pulled her tongue out of her throat, and and then applied pressure, direct pressure onto the cot. She was still strapped in above me and uh, bleeding on me, and we, uh, Kathy got out the door on the... Uh, on the left side of the plane, okay, and uh, we managed to uh, lower her down onto me, and then we uh, pulled her out. Uh, there was fuel spilling and possible fire, so we had to get her out quick. Um, we just uh, we carry did a blanket carry over to here, so okay. She lost a lot of blood, and also she was uh, throwing up blood. She's been vomiting blood all night long, so okay. um, she passed out earlier. She passed out about four hours ago, and we woke her back up again and kept her kept her going. Okay. Okay. She's been complaining about gravel in her eyes and a uh, sore uh, lower back and hips, uh, sore shin and a sore uh, wrist. Mm -hmm. And her her finger is also was broken when we uh, we straightened her finger out because it was bent all the way back. Okay. Uh, what, what are we on here? A air mattress? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Sorry about your mackinaw here. My shin hurts. You got a little cut on your shin there. Yeah. 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 Pelvis is stable, mm -hmm. so we're all long bones. We've got good pulses. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're doing pretty good. Yeah. One finger on this right hand. Okay. This is, all right. The rest one. of them don't hit at all. All right. Squeeze my hand best you can. Sure. And loose. Okay. she got a good steady. What's your hand? Oh, look at your hair. I'm not going to cut your hair. <laughs> Boy, you're a worrisome <laughs> rascal today. My face hurts. I understand. I want you to hold your head still. Don't move. She can see how much uh, of a handful we had trying to keep her in one place. So you don't want Bryce didn't want to pack you out. Yeah. Were you up walking? No. Well, she tried. She didn't get too far, though. That's here. The other way, you better get the bed at the right end here. Uh, we'll need some help when we move her here, okay? I know, we'll put you some drops in it. As soon as you can. I'm going to slide her out on this. Can you do that? Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, if we get one person here and one person here to give us a hand, John's going to control the hand. That's all he's going to be able to do. Okay? And what we'd like to do is take this 
And we're going to use it without tilting her head. We're going to we're going to move her straight out that way. Everything's going to be done on Yon's command. Is everybody clear on what we want to get done? I'm set. We are. Let's just go so it hits the clear of the door and then it starts again. Okay. 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 One more about a foot and a half. Okay. Ready? Two, three. Is it there that you see Yeah, we're going to. She, she's on it. Let's leave it. Okay. Can we take the sleeping bag and uh, just pull the Velcro up on the sides? You're looking good, Mom. Oh, okay. I know. Spider straps are in there. Okay. Well, no, it's first trip to the ball. It was a tape dot and then. Are you sure you don't remember? Let me take them out. Yeah. Hand on my right temple. How's that? Better? Hold my hand off. Sorry, no sleep fix, bro. You're doing great, Mom. I don't, can't leave this bad. Oh, it's, it is. Yeah, it's bad. Help with the head. I'll help you do the spider. Oh, well. Would you guys say that was probably the straightest crash landing you ever saw? Ow. Sorry. I'll just lay that there. What? One of you. Come get me. Okay, we'll work on that, okay? With that, I guess, thanks. Thank you all. Good directions, good work. Are my kids okay? One last thing. Yeah, they're, they're getting a ride down right with here. the search and rescue guys. Okay. So they'll be fine. Okay. How long does that take? They got a pretty good drive ahead of them. They're probably about four hours to Grangeville, probably. I beat up as my face. Hey, um, let me touch you. Gonna need some. Are you hurt stuff. anywhere else? One last time. And this is Life Flight getting ready to lift off. And this is what it looks like if we would have missed the ridge. Pretty rugged. Uh, so right after spending the night here, my first thought was, uh, wow, once we get out of here, you know, what's going to happen? Yeah, we're going to be stuck up here a while. No. Hey, look, it's the guys in the truck. Yay. Uh, the search and rescue team. And uh, everything was going to be okay. And uh, but I, I was supposed to be at work on Monday morning for a new job. I had been trying to get for a long time a, a delivery job at Ivory Sea, right? This photo lab I was working at. I was in the production room in the back and I hated it and I just wanted to do something else so the delivery position was a step up for me and um, so I didn't show up for my first day of work and uh, I, <laughs> I remember calling my 
soon to be boss and telling her, I think it was Tuesday or something. I don't know when it was. I was in a plane crash and uh, I, I'm kind of beat up, but I, I'm coming in on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. She hangs up the phone. Later on recounts that she's like, fuck out, jackass, motherfucker, caught in a plane crash, you drunk, you know, why'd I hire you, blah, blah, blah. And then I came into work with this roll of film. <laughs> and nobody believed me in this whole building. I've been working there for months, you know, and they knew I was a joker, but I wouldn't pull anything like that, you know, but uh, not show up for work. I mean, that's you get fired for that, right? I, I like my job. I wanted to stay there. Um, so, yeah, um, what immediately preceded the crash once I got home, uh, mm, I started riding my bike around without my helmet for a while. So, we crashed, and we weren't here for very long. I'm really curious about our, like, what happened when you got home? Mm. When we got home, huh? Well, uh, um, yeah, I, it, uh, it just kind of came unhinged, you know. It was like, uh, uh, now that you've crashed a plane into the top of a mountain, nothing else is going to kill you, and um, you, the odds are that you won't die from anything else, really, after that. If you think about it, kind of in a, I don't know. It doesn't make sense numerically, but logically, it doesn't make sense. But like spiritually, it makes sense because you've cheated death, like to the point where you had a chance to think about. Just imagine a firing squad or something taking a really long time to shoot you, kind of like that, or or I don't know, driving your car off a cliff, but it was a. 5,000 feet off the edge of the cliff. You had a time to fall <laughs> before you crashed, you know. I mean, uh, I tell people it's like um, you get your family in the station wagon and the accelerator sticks down and you've got a cliff right in front of you. You're going to smash straight into it. It's just a brick wall and you're coming straight at it and you can't you can't steer left or right. You, you just have to keep going. The only chance you have of stopping is to hit the brick wall, you know. And you know when you're going to hit the brick wall, it's going to hurt a lot, you know. <laughs> You'll probably die. and uh, But then you don't. Ta-da! I thought a lot about my purpose in life. I wondered a lot about what I had done with it so far and what my plans for the future were. I stumbled pretty hard on this idea. What if my purpose in life was to save my mom? What else did I have to live for? What else was there for me? What now? I felt outside of this world. I felt outside of my friends. Everything seemed inconsequential. I regularly felt that I had cheated death and that I was on bonus time after the accident. And I think without really realizing it, I gave up on planning a future for myself. I did fuck all with aplomb. I pushed my invincibility. I took up what some would consider dangerous hobbies. Fast motorcycles, snowboarding, fire dancing, Burning Man, drugs, sometimes all at the same time. I worked at a software firm. At the end of the day, I'd pack up mailers to ship out. I'd call my friend Toby and he would play his ham and B3 while I worked. Those phone calls were a lifeline. I got a kitten so that I would go home every day. Getting a kitten might have seemed a little irresponsible, but that cat Jumbug and Toby saved my life. They kept me from being in my head by myself, reminding me that I belonged to this world. I was expected to step back into my life like nothing major had just happened. I was encouraged to diminish the event as a minor occurrence, that just a thing that had happened that Sunday. I heard a lot of, get over it, put it behind you. It could have been worse. And at least you weren't hurt. When actually I had fractured bones, back and neck injuries, unseen internal trauma. But I looked fine. 
This accident has been a major defining moment in my life. The first turn into a long, slow spiral of despair that would carve deep grooves into my psyche. I've spent countless hours in therapy working on my PTSD, learning coping skills, talking, and a lot of crying. It's been a long time and I'm still inexperienced at navigating this world. Now, instead of being numb or experiencing episodes of rage, I'm merely profoundly sad. I can only strive to understand what I'm up against. PTSD is a gnarly beast, wild and feral. I get close to understanding it, and then it lashes out at me with fangs and claws to break me open again. I've learned that we don't recover from PTSD. We just kind of learn to live with it. For years, I'd wake up terrified, bolt out of bed swinging. More than a few times, I injured myself in the process. A torn rotator cuff, twisted ankles. I even broke up with a guy after a long relationship because I didn't recognize him when I woke up and it scared the crap out of me. So I kicked him to the curb. Can you talk about closure for you? Sure, closure for me, um, it was a mystery up until, you know, actually arriving at the crash site, the whole thing was a, a mystery. And uh, so the mystery has been solved. And the answers are that, you know, it was a long ways away from anywhere. And uh, that's about it. It's a beautiful country and, it, you know, it, I would never have driven out here for any other reason than to go to the airplane crash and site. And it never would have came back and visited, you know, our, our hosts, I guess, or had opportunity to, you know, really spend the night on top of a, a mountain truly in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, uh, it, it, I always wanted to do it. Now we've done it. It's been done, you know, which is cool. It's a mission completed successfully. I used to think that, like, a big part of me got left up on top of that mountain when I kind of lost my innocence, you know, hitting the ground like that. But really, you know, it was good. It was good to know that, that we did the right thing and it was the best that we could do. And You know what I mean? Like, not like not knowing if we needed to fly 10 more meters over the next ridge would we have seen an airport was the right decision to crash into a road. And the answer is yes. And it was a, you know, did we treat our wounds properly? Yeah, we did that. And uh, did we deploy, you know, all the safety equipment and stuff yeah we did all that so it's kind of like almost like a big pat on the back i mean we i know we we lived through it and all that uh, but this was like congratulations on a job well done thanks for coming back and like you know you should you know hold your head up with some pride and knowing that you guys you know that what we survived was an unsurvivable incident usually so that was pretty cool I mean, we've heard straight from the horse's mouth uh, that people don't live through crashes like that. And it was a lot of fun putting the, 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 uh, the kind of like the stamp on the envelope that, that now, you know, send that memory off. And, it, you know, it's, it's safe, you know, it's, it's, it's done. It's, I don't have to contemplate what if anymore. But yeah, uh, overwhelming sense now of just like of satisfaction that you know that uh, that the uh, kind of like you earned uh, your life, you worked for it, and you're able to accomplish that, and you're you know to have like the forethought and be able to you know have the training to be able to do that. With really, you know, not a lot of negative outcome other than, you know, the trauma of sliming into a mountain. But and also our 
our military training it helped a lot I guess I want to come back again I think it'd be fun